Lucia, would you please stand up so everyone can see you? This is my lovely bride of 40 years. Wow. <laughs> the Lord has been very gracious to us. He's fulfilled his promise to us. And what Psalm is that? Psalm 92, where it says, uh, even in old age, they will remain fresh and green. And uh, I'm officially a senior citizen, but man, I feel like 20 years younger. God has really, he's really, what's the word? He's really um, preserved us. Yes, preserved us. All right. Uh, before I forget, let me remind you that later this afternoon, we're going to be ministering healing at a distance to people with heart conditions. Okay, so uh, make sure that you text or call them, perhaps uh, during lunchtime, during the lunch break, call or text them. Tell them that between one and three, you are going to call them and minister healing to them for their heart condition over the telephone. All right. Is anyone going to do that, by the way? You know someone with a heart condition and you're going to minister between one and three. Okay, so make sure you, you and, and they don't have to be here in Tennessee. They could be in Hong Kong. It doesn't matter. They're in Texas. Oh, that's far enough. Good. Okay. Because distance does not affect authority at all. Correct? Not one iota. So it doesn't matter where they are. Okay. All right. Great. Is there anyone here who was not here last night? Would you raise your hand? Okay. A few of you. All right. Let me just go over very briefly what we studied last night. Last night, we saw that according to John 14, 12, we believers should be doing the works that Jesus did. And what works, that Jesus, what works did he do? Well, he primarily preached the gospel, he healed the sick, he cast out demons, and he made disciples. And why did he heal the sick and cast out demons? Why did he perform miracles? It was primarily to demonstrate to the lost that he was, in fact, the promised Messiah, the Son of God, and that he had authority to forgive sin and grant eternal life. So the miraculous healings that he performed were the evidence of who he was, the Son of God, the only way to the Father. And according to John 14, 12, we are going to do the works that he did. We are going to heal the sick as he did. We're going to cast out demons as he did. We're going to preach the gospel as he did. <clears throat> and so last night we studied how he healed the sick, how he cast out demons. And we discovered that Jesus actually never prayed for the sick the way we do traditionally in the church today. He did not need to pray for the sick because the Father had given him power and authority over demons and diseases when the Holy Spirit came upon him at the Jordan River. And since he had authority over diseases, he did not need to ask the Father to heal sick people. He himself could heal them. Now, how do you exercise authority? you issue a command to that which is under your authority. And since it is under your authority, it must obey your commands. So as an example, Jesus was asked to minister to Peter's mother-in-law who was suffering from a really bad fever. Okay, how did Jesus minister to her? He simply rebuked the fever. He spoke to the fever and commanded it to go and the fever obeyed and Peter's mother-in-law was healed. Okay, that's how you exercise authority, by issuing a command, not by praying to God. Now, where you do not have authority, that's where you need to pray to God, because God has all authority. So where you don't have authority, absolutely, you pray to God. But where you do have authority, you don't need to pray to God. You simply exercise the authority by issuing a command. For example, the best example I can think of is your dog. You have authority over your dog. If you want him to sit, you do not pray to God and ask God to make him sit. You simply tell him to sit and he should sit. Period. End of story. Okay. And that's how Jesus ministered to the sick and cast out demons. He would command demons to leave. He would speak to the sick. He would speak to the leprosy. He would speak to the infirmity and issue commands. And because those things were under his authority, they would obey and people were healed. According to John 14, 12, we should be doing the same thing. But it turns out that we haven't been ministering to, sick, to the sick as Jesus did. When we minister to the sick, there's a lot of praying, there's a lot of drama, there's hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, there is speaking in tongues, you know what I mean? But Jesus did none of those things. There was no drama, all he did was issue commands. So last night, 
we learned to issue commands. You noticed last night when we ministered, when people were healed, was there any praying? No. Was, was there any hallelujah, thank you, Jesus? No. Was there any help me, Jesus? No. Was there any speaking in tongues? No. We simply gave commands in the name of Jesus with authority, with mountain moving faith, with no doubt. And people were healed. Amen. Okay. So it actually works. Okay. You have to take a break already? Huh? Oh, yes. In addition to issuing commands, we also laid hands on the sick. And when you lay hands on the sick, the healing power of Jesus who lives in you flows into the sick person to heal them. So we did those two things that we see prevalent in the ministry of Jesus himself, the exercise of power by laying hands on the sick for the healing power to flow and the exercise of authority by issuing commands. All right. Now, last night, you recall we were ministering to two, two sisters who had TMJ, okay? And uh, one of them was much better, and the other one was not yet healed. But while we were ministering to them, Brother Steve, who was sitting, who was ministering, who was serving in the back, he also had a problem in that area, and he was healed. Even though we were ministering to these two, Steve, Steve you want to come up here and just share very quickly what happened, all right? <laughs> because this shows us... This gives us an understanding of the nature of authority. Here is Brother Steve. So I know you guys wouldn't believe this, but because um, I typically have a big mouth, but my mouth really didn't open all that what was painful to eat like a Big Mac or something like that to open up my jaw to do that. And so last night um, when we were kind of praying, well, not praying, when we were commanding um, over uh, um, these folks up here, my I just was like, okay, her jaw's popping too. So like my jaw kind of, pops and doesn't open, but I walked up, it was funny because I walked up to Melissa and I was like, uh, and she was like, oh my goodness, your mouth. I'm like, yeah. So last night I went and got, uh, afterwards we went to Steak and Shake and I got a double steak burger because I could open my mouth and, go, and open it. So um, yeah, praise God that um, for, for a long time, for, and I never really complained about it because it's not my deal to complain about it, but so you thought my mouth was big before, now it's really big. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now, how can we understand that mentally? Okay, we know God did a miracle, but exactly how in the context of authority? Well, it's quite simple. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you have three dogs in your home, okay? And all of them are under your authority, okay? And it happens that uh, you've got two of the dogs in front of you, okay? And the third one is... Is, is back there, okay? And you want these two dogs to sit, and you, so you issue the command, sit. Do you think the dog back there might also sit? Hmm, okay. Now, I think that's what happened here, <laughs> okay? Okay, that's what happened here, okay? But of course, we were not talking about dogs, we're talking about infirmities, but I believe that's, if you want to understand it, that's the understanding, okay? That's the nature of authority. Okay, authority is not limited by distance. It's not limited by number as well. For example, let's say you're a general in the army, all right? And you've got authority over 10,000 soldiers, okay? And you wanna issue a command, so you call one of your men into your office and you give him a command and he says, yes, sir, right away, sir, he obeys. Uh, can you call five of your soldiers into your office and give five of them the same command? Will all five of them obey? Absolutely. Can you, can you send a command to all 10,000 soldiers and will all of them obey? Yes. Okay. That's the nature of authority. Okay. Uh, you may have heard of these um, well-known superstar preachers who can minister mass healing. Have you ever heard of that? Mass healing, when many people get healed at the same time. Now you know their secret. They simply minister with authority over a crowd of people, many of whom have infirmities, and many of those infirmities will be under their authority. And guess what? Those infirmities leave and those people are healed simultaneously. That is how they do it, okay? They're not gonna share with you with that secret 
but I did, <laughs> all right? And so you can minister mass healing, okay? It's not a big deal. I have trained people who have ministered mass. You will be able to mass healing. Just go on a mission trip to Africa somewhere and get a crowd of people and, and then go for it. <laughs> Blow the enemy away, all right? It doesn't have to be Africa. It can be right here. In fact, on Sunday morning, we will minister mass healing, okay? Yeah. A Sunday morning to show you how it's done. It's actually very easy. It's just the exercise of authority, okay? All right. Let's continue with the teaching we saw that the disciples failed to heal a boy who had leprosy because they had little faith. You recall that from Matthew 17. They had tried to cast a demon out of a boy with leprosy. They failed. They went to Jesus and they said, why couldn't we cast it out? And Jesus said, because of your little faith. I tell you the truth, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. All right? And we saw from last night that mountain moving faith means having no doubt. When you have authority over something, you can issue a command to that thing without any doubt. That's the nature of authority. Let's go deeper into this. Exactly what is faith as a mustard seed or mountain moving faith? Mark eleven twelve. Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now, we're not going to look at this from a spiritual point of view. We're just going to look at exactly how did Jesus curse this fig tree. We're just going to look at the mechanics of how he did this miracle, okay? We're not going to go any farther than that. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. All right, notice what Jesus did. He's talking to the tree, how many of us usually talk to trees? Okay. The men never talk to trees. Ladies will talk to flowers and plants. I get it, okay? But we men, we never talk to things like trees and whatnot, okay? Doesn't make sense. But here we see Jesus actually speaking to the fig tree. And what is he saying to it? He is essentially commanding it to die. May no one ever eat food from you again. Okay, he's cursing this tree, issuing a command, okay? And let's see what happened. Of course, you know what happened. Verse 20, in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. A great miracle took place. Now, how did Jesus do this miracle? Was it by prayer to the Father? No. Again, I'm not discouraging you from praying. <laughs> you will continue to pray and fast. But prayer and fasting are a preparation for you to do stuff like this, to move mountains. Okay? All right. Jesus did not perform this miracle by praying to God, but rather by issuing a command to the fig tree. May no one ever eat food from you again. Uh, the father had given him authority over the tree. He wanted it to die. So he commanded it to die and it obeyed as, as simply as that. Okay. Now, Exactly how did Jesus issue the command to the tree resulting in the miracle? How? 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 We're going to find out. Verse 21, Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. You see, Peter, he's very interested in the miracle which he has just witnessed. I believe that Peter is the disciple who is really fascinated by the miracles he sees Jesus doing, okay? Remember the occasion on which Peter was on the boat on the Sea of Galilee, and Peter sees Jesus walking on the water toward him, okay? What does Peter want to do? Peter also wants to walk on water. He's fascinated with miracles. He wants to do the stuff that he sees Jesus doing. And he has just witnessed Jesus performing this miracle on this fig tree, and I believe he is interested. He wants to know how Jesus did it, okay? In the next verse, Jesus reveals exactly how he used authority to perform the miracle. Okay, are you ready? 
Next verse. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Now, I have looked at this verse in the Greek, and I have discovered that there's another translation. In fact, literally, Jesus did not say, have faith in God. Literally, Jesus said, have faith of God. Okay. Some of you have probably never been exposed to this. But if you know Greek, in the Greek text, God is in the genitive or possessive case. So literally, this should be translated, have faith of God. When Jesus spoke to the fig tree, he spoke with faith of God. Now, what does this mean? If you've never heard of faith of God, it sounds really strange. You know, we need to have faith. We sinners need to have faith in God. How could God himself have faith? What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out what that means in a moment as we go on. Most literal versions of the Bible actually render this verse, have faith of God. If you look at the literal translations of the Bible, for example, YLT, which means Young's literal translation, renders that verse, and answering Jesus saith to them, have faith of God. So even according to the scholars, this is an acceptable translation, have faith of God. The literal translation of the Holy Bible renders it, Jesus said to them, have faith of God. Even the modern King James Version renders it, have faith of God. So this is not some kooky teaching, but actually, literally, Jesus said, had faith of God. When he spoke to the fig tree, he spoke with faith of God. So let's find out what this means. Verse 22, repeating verse 22, Answering, Jesus said, have faith of God. Verse 23, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. Now, who is speaking to the mountain here? Is it only God speaking to the mountain? No, anyone, any of you speak to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen. It will be done for him. When Jesus spoke to this fig tree, he had no doubt in his heart. He believed that what he said would happen and it was done for him. And how could Jesus speak to the fig tree with no doubt? Because it was under his authority. Okay. You see how we always connect this back to understanding authority. I think that's key. You know, for us to have no doubt, we need to understand that we have authority over disease and demons. Okay? Yes. See? That's the key here for me. If I don't know I have authority over it, how can I command it? All right? For example, can you command God? No. Why not? Because he has authority over us. <laughs> we don't have any authority over him. He is God. All right? So we don't command God. So what can we command? Those things which are under our authority. It makes such sense, right? Like your dog, like your, your little children, if one day you'll have children, right? <laughs> or demons or diseases when you're preaching the gospel, those things are under our authority, all right? And so Jesus here is teaching about faith of God or mountain moving faith. They are equivalent functionally. Faith of God has two ingredients. Number one, no doubt in your heart. Number two, what I say must be done. And people who have authority, they understand that. When people with authority issue commands to those under their authority, they have no doubt in their heart that what they say is going to get done. Amen? Isn't that right, Tommy? <laughs> That's authority. What I say is going to be done because I'm in charge here. Okay. You got that? Okay. When Jesus spoke to that fig tree, he spoke with faith of God. And that's how you're going to speak to diseases and demons. Faith of God. No doubt. Based on the fact that Jesus had put them under your authority, especially when you're sharing the gospel with the lost. Now, 
faith in God. Now, of course, that is foundational. That is important, faith in God. It starts with faith in God. Now, faith in God implies we waiting on God for him to act and move the mountain. All right? That's what faith in God implies. And where we don't have authority over the mountain, absolutely, we exercise faith in God, we pray to God, and trust him to move the mountain for us. But where we have been given authority over the mountain, what do we do? We exercise faith of God. That implies we ourselves taking action by speaking to the mountain without any doubt. Okay, you see the difference between the two. Faith in God, that's what brings you into the kingdom of God. That's what saves you, all right? But after you enter the kingdom of God, you want to serve him fruitfully. You want to do the works that Jesus did. That's when you need faith of God to move mountains, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, all right? Now, the church understands faith in God, absolutely. We know faith in God, but we have not been taught faith of God. And that's one reason why we don't see these miracles today. That's one reason why we don't see what we, we read of in the book of Acts. Today, it seems like the church has been emasculated in terms of signs and wonders. And one reason is we have not been taught faith of God. Is it any wonder why the church has been kept from understanding this verse? Okay. Not surprising. You know, Satan cannot stop us from entering the kingdom of God. He cannot stop us from having faith in God. But after we receive faith in God and receive eternal life and become children of God, Satan would have us say, okay, that's it, no more. You're not going any further than that. You're saved, but you're not going to serve God effectively. I'm going to blind you to the truth of faith of God, by which you will be able to do the works of God and serve him fruitfully. I believe that somehow we have been, our eyes have been veiled from understanding faith of God in order to do the works of God. But I believe that now we have entered into the last days. You believe that? We're in the last days, which means we have to fulfill the Great Commission. And in order for us to fulfill the Great Commission, we need to understand faith of God in order to do the works of God, in order to make disciples of all nations, including nations in the third world, not just in the West, but we're talking about nations right now dominated by Hinduism and Islam and Buddhism. You want to take on those giants? You need these signs and wonders if you are going to make disciples in those heavily gospel resistant nations. Okay, uh, this is our area missions okay we know how tough it is over there all right and you will need these weapons these nuclear weapons to win the lost in those gospel resistant nations okay when you go over there and god uses you to perform miracles that they have never ever seen from their gods guess what many of them will want to believe in the one true god through his son jesus christ okay that's what happened in the book of Acts. Okay, when Paul went out throughout the known world, he preached the gospel to idol worshipers, to Gentiles. And his ministry was followed by great signs and wonders. And that's why he was so fruitful. And I believe God wants to restore that today. Amen. Today. I'm so glad that I see so many young people here because you're going to be missionaries. Okay. You're going to be missionaries. All right. Amen. Glory to God. So where we have been commanded to act and have been given to the authority to do so, we must not just sit around waiting for God to act. Amen. We must take action. And part of this action may involve speaking forth with faith of God, speaking to the mountain, to the disease, to the demon with faith of God. And that's what happened last night when those miracles took place. You laid hands on people and you spoke to those infirmities with faith of God, with no doubt. 
faith of God can be understood as mountain moving faith. They are functionally equivalent. Jesus performed the miracle by exercising his authority and commanding the tree to wither with faith of God or mountain moving faith. And the tree obeyed. And we're going to apply that to healing the sick and casting out demons. Now, let's look at faith as a mustard seed. Faith as, not as small as, all right? Uh, for those of you who were not here yesterday, the Bible does not say faith as small as a mustard seed. It says faith as a mustard seed. Faith as small as a mustard seed means very little faith. Does little faith please God? No. Okay? Little faith does not please God. Great faith pleases God. So we want great faith. So we want faith with the nature of a mustard seed, not faith with the size of a mustard seed, but faith with the nature of a mustard seed. Let's look at the nature of a mustard seed. Okay? I was in Australia last year, and there we were hosted by a brother who, who has farmland, and he's also an airline pilot instructor, all right? And um, he took me to one of the fields near his home where there was a field of canola. Okay, it turns out that canola is from the same family as the mustard seed. Any of you use canola in your cooking? You probably do, right? It's supposed to be very healthy, okay? So canola, let's say canola is kind of equivalent. It's related to mustard seed, okay? Now, what is, the, what is the nature of that mustard seed? Okay, you notice the hand, that's my hand, and, and I don't have a big hand, all right? And, and that seed is, well, it's, it's nearly invisible, right? That's the nature of this mustard seed as seen from the outside. It's nearly invisible. But this nearly invisible canola seed can result in a very visible and fruitful canola plant. Okay. There I am standing in a field of canola. Okay. Now, how fruitful is canola? Well, look at that. Okay, that's the strong stemmed plant coming out from the ground, which grows from that nearly invisible canola seed. That's the plant, okay? Let's look at the top of the plant. You see all of those pods there, those long pods look like string beans. Okay, each one of those many pods contains about 30 canola seeds. And each plant has several, I don't know how many, but quite a few of these pods, all right? So from one canola seed, you get, I don't know how many canola seeds, okay? Each one of those pods is filled with 30 canola seeds, all right? So a canola seed is extremely fruitful, extremely productive, right? And each seed is very rich in oil, 46% by weight is oil in each seed, okay? That, that's pretty profitable, isn't it, all right? Now, you see this harvest field here? Only two or three kilograms of a canola seeds results in this harvest for one hectare. Only two or three kilograms. By contrast, it takes about 100 kilograms of wheat to achieve the same harvest over one hectare. So are you starting to see the nature of a mustard seed? Okay. A canola seed is rich and packed with potential. It can be extremely fruitful and productive. Okay. But a canola or mustard seed is nearly invisible and has little outward physical substance. Okay, that's the nature of the mustard seed. It's nearly invisible. It has very little physical structure, but it is so fruitful and productive and rich. Got that? Okay, now, how about faith? We've been talking about faith as a mustard seed. Okay, we understand mustard seed now. Now, what about faith as a mustard seed? Well, faith is invisible just like a mustard seed. 
Uh, is faith visible? Can you see faith? No. So in that way, faith is just like a mustard seed. Faith is invisible and has no physical substance at all. So faith is like a mustard seed. Got that? All right. But invisible faith of God can reap a great harvest of visible fruit or results. Faith of God, which is invisible, can move a mountain, can move an infirmity, can heal the sick, can move a demon, and can yield great results in the realm of the physical or the here and now. Faith as a mustard seed. All right? You got that? can move mountains in the realm of the physical, create great changes in the realm of the physical. And what is the nature of God? Excuse me. What is the nature of faith of God or faith as a mustard seed? It has no doubt. All right. Amen. <laughs> That's what stops us dead in our tracks. The doubt and the fear of failure and the fear of looking bad in front of people. That's what stops us. The doubt which leads to fear. But you have no more doubt. Amen? Besides, you're already dead in Christ, so what do you have to lose if you fail? Well, you've got no reputation anyway, right? <laughs> but yeah, that's just an aside. Now, having said that, you're not going to fail. You're going to see many people healed, okay? But I want you to be set free from this fear of looking bad in front of people. You need to be set free from that. Okay. It's a stumbling block. It's fear of man. That's all it is. Okay. Once again, Mark 11, verse 12, Jesus said, have faith of God. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. There you go. Faith of God. Faith as a mustard seed. Mountain moving faith. And you all have this faith. Jesus lives in you through the Holy Spirit. You have this faith. All you needed was the word of God to bring it back to life. Now, let's look at a dramatic il illustration, an incident, where we see the consequence of doubting that we can do what the Lord commands us to do. We're going to look at Peter walking on the water. Okay? Now, Peter was on the boat on the Sea of Galilee when he saw Jesus walking on the water. And Peter wanted also to walk on water. Okay? Let's look at this incident in detail. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Notice that before Peter attempts to perform this miracle, he asks Jesus for a command. And this is very wise of Peter. What if Peter did not bother to ask Jesus to tell him to come and just presumption he steps out of the boat into the deep? What would happen to Peter? What would happen? He would sink and he might drown. Okay. And so... Peter is very wise here. Before he attempts to perform this miracle, he awaits a command from the Lord. And this is a basic principle which I think we should apply when we want to move in the supernatural. In the realm of the supernatural, there is potential danger. All right? It's invisible. There's darkness there. And if you want to move in that realm, we have to be careful because there is potential danger. How do we remain safe? We only do what Jesus tells us to do and no more. Does that make sense? You only do what Jesus tells you to do, especially in the realm of the supernatural. Don't go any further than that. Has Jesus commanded us to heal the sick and cast out demons when we preach the gospel to the lost? Absolutely. So we can do that safely and nothing by any means will harm you. But what if we go beyond his command and we start doing things that he'd never commanded us to do. For example, rebuking territorial spirits directly and commanding territorial spirits in Jesus' name to leave this area. Did Jesus ever directly command us 
to do strategic level spiritual warfare by which we directly address territorial spirits, powers and principalities and command them to leave our area in Jesus' name. Is there a command from Jesus to perform that type of action, yes or no? No, there is no direct command of Jesus for us to do that kind of warfare. I know it's very popular in the church. It's called strategic level spiritual warfare. And there are books written on it and there are people who do it, but Jesus never commanded us to do it. And if you do it, you can end up in hot water. If you attacked a powerful demonic being without being authorized by Jesus Christ, guess what he might do to you? He might get ticked off at you and come after you and attack you and slap you around and it's not gonna be pretty. Okay, it will hurt, all right? Just ask Tommy, in the military, we only do what we are commanded to do. For example, one time I was, um, I was in Trinidad, all right? And I was teaching this very subject. And after the teaching, uh, a former Marine came up to me. He was an officer. And he said, he said, William, I used to be a sniper, all right? And uh, we would be commanded to go and take out so-and-so, all right? And we were told the following, you go and take out so-and-so, but when you have so-and-so in your heights, in your sights, excuse me, if you happen to see a higher value target sitting right next to him, maybe, you know, uh, someone of greater rank from the enemy, you do not touch that higher value target. You simply do what you are commanded to do. That's all, no more. Why? Because we already know someone is sitting next to you. We'll take care of that. You just do what you were commanded to do. You got that? Okay. Okay. This is what I heard from this former sniper. Okay. In the same way, we only do what Jesus commands us to do. No more and no less. All right. So as you, as I have made plain, I don't believe strategic level spiritual warfare is scriptural. That means we directly rebuking territorial spirits. It's not praying to God about them, but it's we directly addressing them in Jesus' name, commanding them to leave. That can be potentially dangerous, okay? The enemy can come after you, attack your health and even your loved ones, all right? so. Be careful of that practice. Be careful. All right. Yes, brother. In the area of angels, okay, we don't see Jesus commanding us, telling us to command angels, uh, although they are ministering spirits sent to minister to us. But we really don't see uh, in the scriptures uh, disciples commanding angels. So, so I don't do that. Okay, I'll leave that part up to God. You know, I'll pray to God, and if God wants, God will send ministering angels to, to, to minister here, which he probably is doing, <laughs> all right? They're probably here, we just don't see them, okay? All right, all right, so Peter awaits a command from Jesus to come. Verse 29, come, he said. All right, Jesus issues a command, which means Jesus authorizes him to walk on water, which means it's the will of Jesus for him to perform this miracle. So now Peter can perform it safely. Okay. Then he got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. So far, so good. Okay. Peter is actually obeying the Lord. He's actually walking on water. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. All right, notice that when Peter allowed fear to come into his heart, what was the immediate result? What was the immediate result after the fear came into his heart? He began to sink, which means once you allow fear to come into your heart, you can kiss your miracle goodbye. <laughs> Immediately he sank. All right, now, beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. 
he did what every Christian is taught to do when in danger, right? When you're in danger, Jesus help me. Absolutely, yes, I would do the same thing. However, in this case, was Jesus pleased with Peter's cry? Lord, save me. In this case, was Jesus pleased? Was Jesus pleased with Peter? And as you know, the answer is no. Let's see what happened here. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Yeah, Jesus was gracious to save him. Jesus heard his prayer. Jesus saved him. Absolutely. But then look what Jesus said. You, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Is Jesus pleased with Peter here? Is, is he praising him here? No, he's rebuking him. Does that sound familiar? He's rebuking him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Okay. Now, why is Jesus displeased with Peter? I mean, isn't Jesus pleased that at least he tried? He did his best. I mean, he did his best, right? At least he stepped out of the boat. And most people won't even step out of the boat, right? At least he stepped out of the boat. Isn't Jesus pleased with that? Apparently, no. Let's find out why Jesus was displeased with Peter. It was because he had commanded him to walk on the water and expected him to obey the command successfully. Amen? When Jesus commands us to do something, does he expect us to obey? Yes. And get the job done successfully. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. You know, it's good to step out of the boat. It's good to do our best. But if we fail, is the Lord pleased? Apparently not. Okay. Okay. We're talking about disciples here. We're talking about special forces, kingdom of God here. We are supposed to get the job done. Yes, we do our best and we make sure we get the job done. All right. It was not enough just for Peter to step out of the boat. He also had to walk on water successfully. Correct? Jesus said, come. What does that mean? It means come to me all the way without sinking. Did Peter obey? No, he failed. Jesus is displeased. Okay. Now, but what about the good shepherd who is kind and gentle and meek and patient? Where is, where is that Jesus? He's here. He's here. But this context, what is he doing here? He is training his disciples to take over after he leaves. He is going to entrust the great commission to this handful of disciples. And if they fail, today we would not hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he had to give them the highest level training. Okay. He is training special forces, kingdom of God here, the highest level training possible. So he is not babysitting them. Okay. He is not appearing to them as the Jesus who is kind and gentle and patient. Yes, he is, but he's training them for a great responsibility, the great commission. He got that? Got that? So this is boot camp for special forces, kingdom of God. This is not Sunday school. <laughs> you are special forces and you're going to get the highest level training possible so that you can go out and get the job done without failing. Okay. Amen. Amen. I know there's the grace of God. I understand all of that, but we're talking about fulfilling the great commission, which means you need to be highly trained period. And by the grace of God, you will get the job done because the Lord is with you until the end of the age. All right. Why did Peter sink? Well, it's because he doubted and he had little faith according to Jesus. All right. Because of his little faith and he doubted. Now, does this sound familiar at all with, does this sound like something we studied last night? Yes, it's, 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 it's awfully similar to what Jesus said to the disciples when they failed to cast out the demon. Remember, it's because of your little faith. Uh, hmm. I wonder if there's a relationship between these two incidents. Okay. All right. Peter sank because he doubted. Now, 
The question is exactly what did Peter doubt causing him to sink? All right. Now, in the church, we often teach about doubt. Okay? We teach God's people, never doubt God. God is faithful. Never doubt God's word. God will do, will perform what his word says. Absolutely. We should not doubt God. However, in this case, is Peter doubting God here? Is that why he sank? He's doubting God. No, I don't think so. Did Peter sink because he's doubting Jesus? Is he doubting that Jesus can walk on water? No, he can see Jesus walking on water. He has no doubt that Jesus can walk on water. Exactly what is he doubting here? Come on. He's doubting himself. He's doubting that he can walk on water as Jesus commanded him to do. He knows Jesus can walk on water. He knows nothing is impossible for God. He knows that. We all know that. What we doubt is that we can do what Jesus commands us to do. That's why we fail. You get that? We all know nothing is impossible for God. Of course. What we doubt is that nothing is impossible for us. Amen. You remember what Jesus said? If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. All right. In doubting that he could walk on water as Jesus had commanded him, one could say that Peter lacked what kind of faith? If you doubt, if you have doubt in your heart, what kind of faith do you lack? Huh? Yeah, keep on going. That's it. Faith of God, right? Faith of God. Mountain moving faith. Faith at the mustard seed. You got it. Remember faith as a, do you remember faith of God that we just studied? Here, let me show it to you again. And answering, Jesus said to them, have faith of God. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Peter had doubt. Therefore, he lacked faith of God. So when Jesus said, you have little faith, why did you doubt? What kind of little faith did Peter have? Little faith of God. Got that? Little faith of God. He doubted that he could do what Jesus commanded him to do. So faith in God essentially says, I know the Lord can do it. That's faith in God. I know nothing is impossible for God. That's faith in God. But faith of God is different. Faith of God says, I know I can do it. Because I have been given the authority and the ability and the command from the Lord to do it. I know I can do it. That's faith of God. You see, we all have faith in God. We all know that the Lord can do it. We all know that nothing is impossible for the Lord. Absolutely. But today we're learning faith of God. I know I can do it. Why? Because the Lord commanded me to do it. He's given me the authority to do it. He's trained me how to do it in his word. I can do it. I can heal the sick in Jesus' name when I'm preaching the gospel to the lost. Okay? Now, some people may have a problem with faith of God because it sounds like pride and arrogance. Okay? It sounds like pride and arrogance. Okay? You remember... The Israelites, okay, just before they entered the promised land, they sent in 12 spies, right? And after 40 days, they came out and they gave a report to Moses who was waiting on the other side of the Jordan River. And they all said, hey, it is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. Look, we brought back some grapes. Look at them, you know. But then 10 of them said, however... The inhabitants there are big and ferocious. They're giants. We can't attack them. Let's go back to Egypt. Okay? Fear. Doubt. 
Did God command them to take the promised land? Yes, but these 10 did not want to obey God's command because they saw the giants there. Doubt and fear arose in their hearts, okay? But there were two of them named Caleb and Joshua who were completely different in the spirit that they had. What did they say? We can certainly do it. Let's go in. We can certainly do it because the Lord is with us. With whom was the Lord pleased? The ten or the two? The two. What happened to the other ten? They never entered the promised land. They died in the desert. Only Joshua and Caleb out of those twelve entered the promised land. You want to die in the desert? Anyone want to die in the wilderness and never enter the promised land? Whatever it may mean. We all want to enter the promised land. You want to enter the promised land. You want to be used by God to fulfill the great commission. You need the spirit that was in Caleb. We can certainly do it because the Lord is with us. So faith of God is not an expression of pride or arrogance. It pleases God when we say, yes, Lord, I will get it done. That pleases God. Don't you think? You command me to do it, Jesus? Yes, sir, I will get it done right away, sir. Or do you think when Jesus says, go, make disciples of all nations, heal the sick, cast out demons, do you think Jesus is pleased when we go, oh, Jesus, I'm just saved by grace through faith, not by works, just, I'm useless, I'm helpless, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, I can't do those things, oh, Jesus, send someone else, send Tommy, Lord, oh, Jesus, is God pleased with us when we go to him like that? I don't think so. Tommy, you're in the military. Are you pleased with, with, with if your men come to you like that, you know, shivering in their boots and say, uh, Colonel, we, we, don't send us. We can't do this. You would exercise um, attitude adjustment. Attitude adjustment. <laughs> attitude adjustment. I like that. Politi- politically correct. Attitude adjustment. Okay. And, and that's what God is doing to the church today. Attitude adjustment. All right. We can do it. Amen. We can preach the gospel, we can heal the sick, we can cast out demons, we can make disciples, we can fulfill the Great Commission. Enough of this, oh, Jesus, who do I think I am, Lord? I'm, oh, forget it. Yeah, you know, there is a misinterpretation of that verse. You know, when I am weak, God is strong. You know what Paul is referring to when he talks about weakness? He's talking about persecution and being shipwrecked and being stoned and going hungry because of the gospel. That's the kind of weakness he's talking about. Not weak in faith or weak in terms of holiness. He's not talking about that kind of weakness, but physical weakness due to him preaching the gospel. Okay, all right. Now, of course, faith of God can become Pride, yes, it can become pride. In fact, there are probably servants of God who have been operating with faith of God and their ministries have mushroomed and been blessed by the Lord and eventually they go after the money and the fame. It has happened, okay? It has happened. But it's not going to happen to you. Amen? No, thank you. I don't want to stand before the Lord on that day and say, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name, cast out demons and performed many miracles? And Jesus says, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Okay. Amen. We don't want to be among those. Okay. We're going to remain humble and have the attitude of we are simply unworthy servants and we're simply going to do what he told us to do. We are unworthy servants. Okay. That's our attitude. And let the Lord reward us when we stand before him. Now, every disciple should have faith in God, by which we know that nothing is impossible for God. Should you also have faith of God to obey his commands and to serve him effectively, such that nothing will be impossible for you? Absolutely. All right. It is not enough just for us to step out of the boat. It's a good start, but we must also walk on water successfully. It is not enough just to try to heal the sick as Jesus commands us. 
that's a good start. But we must also heal the sick successfully to bring souls to him. Okay? And now you know how to heal the sick successfully. Okay? Authority in the Greek is exousia. And that is like potential in you given by the Lord. But it's just potential authority. It's just potential. How do you turn that potential into a miraculous healing? It's by issuing the command with mountain moving faith. That transforms the potential into a miraculous healing. Okay? So you all have that authority in you. Jesus lives in you. You have that authority in you. How do you turn that authority into a miracle? Give the command with mountain moving faith. Now, I've neglected to mention power or dunamis. You remember what that is? Healing power. How do you transfer the healing power in you through Christ? Laying on of hands by which the healing power is transferred. Okay? So please do not confuse authority and power. They are not the same. Authority is what you exercise when you give commands. Power is that which is transferred when you lay hands on the sick. Okay? With regard to healing, those are the differences between power and authority. With regard to healing, all right? So we see that when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, he received authority over disease and demons. This authority was used to heal the sick and cast out demons by giving commands to them with faith of God. A measure of this authority has been given to every disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, in contrast, the very different gift of healing can be instant, all or nothing can be unpredictable. It depends upon the moving of the Holy Spirit. That's the gift of healing. But when authority is used properly, people can be healed. When authority is not used, people might not be healed. Just like last night, we ministered to those people. We exercised authority. They were healed. If we didn't exercise that authority, would they be healed? No. And so with authority, the decision is mostly up to you. Mostly up to you. It's a weapon at your side, okay? You choose to use it when you want. Now, of course, having said that, we know God is sovereign. God is sovereign, okay? So this authority is not a magic formula. Not a magic formula. God is sovereign. However, it is something we know the Lord has entrusted us to use for the sake of sharing the gospel with the lost, okay? And that's when it is used most fruitfully. It can be more helpful to view healing the infirm as the process of moving a mountain rather than as an instant, all or nothing, unpredictable event. Okay. You saw last night when we were ministering to those two last sisters, we kept on commanding. It was a process. Every time we commanded, there was some change in their TMJ. You remember that? Every time we commanded, the mountain moved, there was a change. And so healing the sick is like moving a mountain. Now, why is it that in the case of Jesus, usually it was instant? He didn't have to usually minister three or four times. Why is that? Because he is Jesus, yes. He has great authority, great power, great faith. And so when he issued commands, the mountains moved quickly. So it appeared to be instant, okay? We are still learning, right? We're in first grade but we're going to grow in power. We're going to grow in authority. We're going to grow in faith to become more and more like Jesus, okay? But until then, when we minister, it can be like a process, okay? Actually, there is a case in the Gospels where Jesus had to minister twice. Remember the blind man? I believe it's in Mark 8, if I'm not mistaken. How many times did Jesus have to touch him? Two times, okay? So if Jesus had to minister two times, how about you and me? <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to minister two times, three times, maybe four times. In fact, let me give you a testimony. This was a pastor in Brazil. We have been going there quite frequently in recent years, and he had been trained to minister with power and authority. And he was quite effective. One time he was ministering in a church event. I believe it was, he was evangelistic, and people were being healed. And a young girl was brought to him, and she was totally blind. She was about 11 years old. 
And her blindness was very unusual. When she opened her eyes, there was no color. It was completely white. It's like a horror movie, okay? Scary. <laughs> and uh, so this pastor in front of the crowd began to minister to her. And uh, this is what you call a big mountain, okay? It's not ordinary blindness. There's no color at all. But he ministered to her in Jesus' name in front of the crowd. He touched her eyes. In the name of Jesus, eyes be open, be healed. She opened her eyes, no change at all, completely white. Okay. So what did he do? He kept going, kept speaking to the mountain. Second time, in the name of Jesus, eyesight be restored. In Jesus' name, she opened her eyes, no change. Okay. What did he do? Did he panic and say, help me, Jesus, what should I do? No, he did not panic. He went for the third time, round three. He ministered, no change. Okay. Around this time, curious people from the congregation went up and climbed up to the stage to watch him. That's what we call pressure. Right? The crowd of people and they're climbing onto the stage looking over your shoulder to see what's going to happen. That's pressure. So is that, is, that, is that the time to back out? No. No. So he goes for the fourth round. No change. Five rounds. No change. You would think by this time the enemy is whispering in his ear, you know, give it, give it up. You know, it's not going to happen. You're making a, you're going to make a fool out of yourself in front of this crowd. But I taught those Brazilians, Brazilians never give up. Just like Tennesseans, never give up. Amen. So he kept going six times, no change. Seven times, no change. And I'm sure he's getting physically tired and he's starting to wonder in his mind what's going to happen all right but he keeps on going eight times no change nine times no change ten times no change and everyone is watching him but this man of God bless his heart he goes for the 11th round after the 11th round this girl starts to rub her eyes furiously and something like scales fall off and she is completely healed. Her yeah. eyes are normal, okay? Yes. <laughs> Just like happened to the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. And that weekend, 150 people accepted Christ. This church doubled in a year, apparently. Went from 700 to 1,500 in a year after they were trained, okay? So... I'm not saying that I could, I could minister like he did, all right? I just teach this stuff. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it, all right? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that, but Tommy can do it, right? <laughs> you see, you remember what Jesus said? Those who believe in me will do, do the works that I did and greater works will they do? That's what I'm saying to you. <laughs> You're going to do greater works. I'm just teaching you how to do them, all right? Yeah, but, but, you know, we've seen some nice miracles, but I want you to see greater miracles. Amen. 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 Okay. Now, here's a caveat. Please remember that even the use of authority is subject to the context and to God's purpose and God's will for the person to be healed. Therefore... The authority to heal should not be considered a general formula for healing and for personal health, okay? So it, it's not a formula that's, that you can do anytime you want. God is still sovereign and it is primarily for sharing the gospel with the lost, okay? It's not a formula for personal health. In other words, you cannot expect to eat like the devil and then simply command the diabetes to go away and command the weight to fall off in Jesus' name. It's not going to work, okay? We have to be responsible and take care of our physical bodies. Proper diet, proper exercise. We are responsible to do that, okay? This is not a general formula for, obeying, for disobeying God's laws for our physical body, okay? While it is certainly helpful in everyday life, it is primarily for the purpose of evangelism. Therefore, it is most effective when used to demonstrate to the lost that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. Okay. Now, if you
you are using authority to heal the sick, do not mix praying and commanding. Last night, uh, did we mix praying and commanding? No, there was no praying at all, all right? But what if you wanna pray? Can you pray first before you minister the healing? Absolutely, okay? If you wanna show respect to the Father, go ahead, first you pray. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask you to glorify yourself by healing this person, Lord. Please release your power and authority to heal, Father. Thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen, okay? Now, okay, that's the priestly, right? That's the priestly. It's up, you've directed it up to the Father. Now, after, in Jesus' name, amen, now you switch modes completely. Now you're going into the attack mode, the kingly mode, which means you roll up your sleeves, Say, all right, come on, let's roll. In the name of Jesus, like George Bush, in the name of Jesus, be healed, okay? Completely different now. This is the kingly mode, the attack mode, offense, okay? So you notice the prophetic, the, the priestly was extremely different, okay? Respectful, worshipful, okay, to the Lord. If you want to do that, that's fine. Go ahead and do it. But after you're done with that, then you leave that behind and go take care of business. Take out your weapon and shoot the enemy between the eyes. Attack. You got that? Can you mix these two? The kingly and the priestly? You can't mix them. They're completely different in nature. One is directed up and this one is directed down. Can you go up and down at the same time? No. Okay. So do not mix praying and commanding in the same breath. It does not make sense. If you want to pray, keep them separate. Okay? okay? These are the rules when you are ministering using authority. Now, if you're operating in the gift of healing, that's different. That might involve prayer. That might involve worship. That might involve speaking in tongues. Okay? Gift of healing is not a kingly action. Gift of healing could be a priestly or a prophetic action, gift of healing. But the authority, it's always a kingly action. All right, okay? So keep those differences in mind. Some of you may have the gift of healing, and that's great. Now you've got two weapons to use. <laughs> gift of healing plus power and authority. And you will be able to move back and forth seamlessly. The Lord will teach you how to go back and forth between the two. All right. I don't have the gift of healing. Okay. I, at least I don't think so, but I understand the authority to heal. And that's why I can teach it like this. Okay. Please keep in mind that it is not always necessary to raise your voice when healing the sick. Okay. 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 Now here in church, we can raise our voice. That's it's fine, okay? But the, the, does a general have to shout his commands before people obey? No. <clears throat> you know, you just say something. Yes, sir, right away, sir. Okay, so it's not how loud you shout. Sometimes you may need to raise your voice when you're dealing with something stubborn. Yeah, but it's not absolutely necessary. For example, if you're in a hospital and you're ministering to someone, don't raise your voice. They will escort you out and think you're some kind of nut. Okay. Can you exercise authority quietly? Absolutely, okay? So authority is not just how loud you shout. It's in here. I have no doubt. This is under my authority. I can do this, okay? It is possible to exercise authority quietly, yet powerfully. Now, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. God, excuse me. God is over us in authority. And how do we relate to God? By faith in God, okay? Faith in God. When we pray to God, that's a priestly action. Faith in God, it's directed up, okay? Now, under our authority are diseases and demons and the works of our flesh. How do we deal with them? Through faith of God. That's how you deal with those things under our authority, okay? 
So faith of God is directed down. Faith of God is directed up. Okay, you see the difference, all right? Notice that I've included authority over the works of our flesh as well. You see, before we came to know Jesus, we, are, we were slaves to our sinful nature, correct? Every day we would sin, like it or not, because we were slaves to sin. Our sin nature ruled over us. But after we came to Jesus, our sin nature was nailed to the cross, so it has lost power over us. Does that mean it's completely dead? No, <laughs> but now it is under our authority, okay? The sin nature is under our authority. So whenever our, our old nature tempts us to lie or cheat or get angry, what should we do to it? No, I'm not going to sin, I rebuke you. Get behind me, anger or greed or lust, get behind me. I'm not going to look at that pornographic website. No way, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Delete, okay? You know what I mean? You see, our young men are tempted on the internet, right? You know, and how do you deal with it? No, I rebuke you, Jesus' name. Delete or whatever, okay? That's how you deal with it. You deal with your flesh just like you deal with a disease or a demon. You're ruthless. You rebuke in Jesus' name. Amen? And it will back off. Your sin nature will back off because it's under your authority. But if you go do something like Oh God, I'm tempted to commit adultery, Lord. If it's your will, yeah, okay, why not? But uh, if it's not your will, Lord, uh, just do something, Lord. Uh, uh, oh Lord, just uh, don't let me see her again, Lord. Okay, now, I get it. It's fine to pray. Lead us not into temptation, absolutely. But after you pray, what do you do? You say no. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. Actively resist. No, in Jesus' name, I'm not going to sin. Okay, there's prayer and there's also action, the exercise of authority. You're not helpless. Okay, it is possible to walk in holiness. It is possible. We have the authority to walk in holiness. We have the authority to resist sin and not to sin against the Lord. Okay, you are not helpless. You can live a life pleasing to God by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And he teaches you to say no to godlessness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled lives in this world. All right? Hallelujah. So this authority is very useful for both diseases and demons and our own flesh. Okay? Now, how can we apply this teaching to fulfill the Great Commission? Well, there are many different approaches, of course, according to the culture, according to where you are. You know, if you're in Saudi Arabia, you, you won't be doing the kind of stuff that you'll be doing here in terms of evangelism, obviously. So it depends on the local context. But let me just share with you something that we did in Brazil, which I found fascinating. This was in a town called Juazeiro do Norte. In Brazil, this is the second most idolatrous town in the entire country of Brazil. Okay? And Brazil is a huge country. It has almost 200 million people. In terms of population, number one is China, followed by India, third is United States, fourth is Indonesia, number five is Brazil. It's a big country, huge, all right? And this town is the second most idolatrous area in this entire country, okay? We went there in July 2010, and I trained 600, over 600 disciples, okay? Every day, every morning, Monday through Friday, we would come together and I would train them as, as you are being trained, all right? And every afternoon after lunch, they would go out into the city and visit the homes, okay? They would break up into small teams and knock on doors. And what they would do was, they would say, oh, hello, you know, we are from Visitation of God. Uh, uh, may we come in and ask God to bless you? Okay. How can you resist that? Okay. And so the people there would say, oh, yes, come in. 
okay, how can we pray for you? And the, and the people in the homes would say, oh, we need this, we need that. And the people would pray for them. And then after the prayer, they would ask, oh, do you have any sick people in the house? And let me tell you, in an idolatrous place like that, there are plenty of sick people. Okay? The more the idolatry, the more the, the demonization and the infirmities. And so these disciples would lay hands on the sick in the homes of these unbelievers. Okay? And these were very idolatrous people. Okay? They visited nearly 10,000 homes over six afternoons. And 1,920 people were healed, mostly in their homes, through these 600 disciples. Nearly 2,000 people healed. And as a result, and after the people were healed, what did they do? They shared the gospel. And 1,440 people accepted Christ during that week. Okay? And all they did was obey Luke 10, verse 9. From house to house, they healed the sick and told them the kingdom of God is near you. That's all they did. And these were the results. It was historic for that area. Now, and so what kind of approach can you take? Well, it depends on where you're going, where God sends you. And pray and ask God for a strategy that involves healing the sick. But let me tell you, wherever you go, you will find sick people. Amen. And there will be many ways to share the gospel by ministering to the sick. Okay? Uh, you may have an area in town, okay, in Franklin, where you have a lot of poor people, where you have minorities. Okay? Uh, minorities will be far more open to people knocking on their doors than, say, Brentwood. <laughs> if you do this in Brentwood, you'll get arrested probably. Okay? But, it, but if you go to a poorer community, minority community, and you knock on doors, people are more willing to open their doors and receive you, okay? And you can say, oh, do you have any sick people in the house? And there will be, you minister to them, they will be healed, and then you share the gospel, all right? So this is something you might consider applying while you are here, you know, in Franklin. Amen? People will be healed. They will be healed, and you will share the gospel with them. Many people will be saved, okay? Uh, do you have an African-American community in Franklin? Yes, yes you do, okay? Uh, typically, those areas are, are more open, okay? Uh, it would be good if when you go to an African-American community, you have an Afri African-American believer with you, okay? I remember one time we did this in Virginia, okay? And we had some really radical believers coming to the training, and they came dressed in camouflage, okay? They're really radical. And, uh, and these are Anglos, okay? And so, <laughs> and so after the training, they decided to go to this black community, door to door, wearing camo, <laughs> camouflage. And these were white boys wearing camouflage, knocking on the doors of African-American people. That didn't go over very well. I don't think any doors are open to them, okay? So we want to be able to adjust to local conditions, all right? Anyway, if you go on a mission trip, um, you can do something more bold, as I mentioned yesterday. You know, go into a village where there's no church. Maybe you can have a feeding event, invite the people to join, join you for a meal, if necessary. The people come to the meal, and before you feed them, you say, we have something to share with you. What do you do? You share the gospel. And after that, you heal the sick. Many people will be healed. And then you give, and then you say, now who wants to believe in Jesus Christ? Many people will believe. You plant a church. Make sure you support a pastor to take care of the flock. And then you feed the people. Okay, okay that's what we do in India. It works quite well. Okay? You might be able to do this in South America, for example, okay? Just pray and the Lord will give you a strategy, okay? The point is, you can do this. You can do this. You can heal the sick and preach the kingdom of God and plant a church, okay, on your mission trip, okay? In addition to painting the church, churches and visiting orphans, you should also do this, all right? 
And, and the Lord is going to bless you and make you very fruitful. And then you can share this with other churches and say, hey, guess what we did on our mission trip? You can do the same thing too, okay? Because it has been a long tradition, you know, when churches in North America send out mission trips to other countries, typically it's mostly good works, painting churches, visiting orphans, and very worthy, but that's all they do, okay? It's time that we got down to business and actually heal the sick and preach the kingdom of God, okay? Amen? It's not only for the full-time missionaries. You can do this as well, okay? And we have sent out short-term mission trips and we have sent out teams of lay people on short-term mission trips and they have done stuff like this, okay? You don't have to be a full-time servant of God to do these things. Uh, do you have the poor and homeless in Franklin? I'm sure you do. Among the poor and homeless, you will find drug, drug addicts quite frequently. And we have seen that drug addicts can quickly be delivered from the craving for the drug by the use of authority and mountain moving faith. You see, drug addiction, I believe, is a combination of physical addiction and the demonic. There's both. And it happens that we have authority in both areas, right? Both over the physical and over the demonic. So you minister to drug addicts using this power and authority, all right? And you will see that their craving immediately disappears. Before you minister to them, they were craving for the drug. After you minister to them, there may be some manifestations. Suddenly they say, hey, I feel different. I have no more desire for the drug, okay? And then it's imperative that they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If they don't, it may come back probably even worse, okay? They must be discipled. Even people addicted to nicotine, smoking, can be set free from their addiction. One time back in Houston, um, we were ministering in a church and uh, there was a couple there. They loved the Lord, committed to the Lord, serving in the church, but both husband and wife couldn't stop smoking, but they were desperate to be set free. So they came to me and said, Brother William, please minister to us. We want to stop smoking. Okay. They were from uh, Louisiana, I believe. And so I just laid hands on them and exercised authority. And as I did, they felt something coming out of the pores of their skin. Okay. And by the time we were done, the brother said, hey, Brother William, it's completely gone. I feel completely different. There's no more desire for the smoking. That week... He went through the most stressful week of his life at work and not once did he feel like smoking, okay? Apparently that's when you feel like lighting up, when, when it's stressful. He didn't feel a desire at all to light up, okay? And he told me, when I think about lighting up, I get sick, okay? So this power and authority are very useful for ministry. Now, okay, let me finish up with this. We're going to stop at 11. Now, why should we obey the Great Commission? Okay. You want to obey the Great Commission, right? Is there, is there an amen? You want to obey the Great Commission. Right. Well, why should we obey the Lord? Give me a good reason why we should do this. Yes, we love the Lord. We want to obey him. Amen. But is there any other reason? I'm going to give you a reason now. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. All right. Our goal is to please the Lord. Now, why do we have to please God? After all, we're saved by grace through faith, <laughs> not by works. So why do we have to obey the Lord? Well, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is talking about believers, all right? Not unbelievers. It's talking about you and me. Every one of us will appear before something called the judgment seat of Christ. And what's going to happen there? Well, that each one may receive what is due him for the things well done in the body, whether good 
or bad. Okay? At the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to receive our reward from the Lord. Okay? And it will be based on the things we have done in this life, whether good or bad. So this is not talking about eternal life. Okay? That's already taken care of. That's already a settled issue. Eternal life by grace through faith, not by works. But this is talking about eternal reward in addition to eternal life. And this eternal reward is indeed based upon the things that you did in this life, whether good or bad. Hmm. Okay. So after Christ returns, we will all appear before his judgment seat to receive our eternal reward, not salvation, according to the works we have done. Eternal reward, as I mentioned, is in addition to salvation. Okay. We should all want to maximize our eternal reward from the Lord. How many of you don't mind receiving the minimum reward from the Lord? You know, as long as you make it by the skin of your teeth, you're happy with that. You know, a big eternal reward, you don't care as long as you make it to heaven. Is there anyone here like that? And it's okay if you are, but, uh, yeah? If I risk that much, I may actually fail. Oh, yeah. If, you, if you've got that kind of attitude, who knows? Yeah, right. Okay. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I want to maximize my eternal reward. Okay. Let me give you an illustration. Here in America, most of us are saving up for retirement, right? Okay. You have all of your, what, 401ks or something? You know, we, we have a, our youngest daughter, her name is Christina, you know, she's my baby. But she's already teaching math in high school. She's just a baby, but she's already saving up for retirement, you know. Every month, I don't know how much goes into a retirement account, okay. So here in America, we're extremely concerned about retirement, okay. And in fact, we all try to maximize the salary that we're getting just before retirement in order to maximize the benefits that we'll get later after retirement, right? So in American culture, retirement is extremely important. We want to have the maximum that we can get for retirement. Uh, is that reasonable? I believe so, yeah. We want to have enough. We don't want to have to depend upon our children. We don't want to have to go out and get food stamps. We want to have a lot for retirement so we can be a blessing. Amen, Pastor? <laughs> we will be a blessing to the work of God, okay? So it makes sense to want to maximize your retirement benefits. No problem there, okay? Now, how long are your retirement benefits going to last? How many years? Approximately 15, 20 max, and then after that you, you leave, right? Okay? That's how long you get to enjoy your retirement benefits, okay? How about eternal reward? How many years is that going to last? How many years? A hundred? Two hundred? Five hundred? Thousand? Forever and ever and ever and ever. That's how long your eternal reward is going to last. Okay? So if your earthly retirement is important to you, how much more your eternal reward should be to you? Amen. Amen. And this goes for every one of us, those of us nearing retirement age and those of us who are young, like these sitting in the front, just getting started, okay? And so it makes sense that we should want to maximize our eternal reward, right? Let's not just settle, but let's receive as much as possible from the Lord because that's what he wants to give us. He wants to reward us according to our works, okay? So we're not being greedy here. I think God is pleased when we have that attitude. Lord, I want to stand before you and please you and obey you with all I've got. And Lord, I don't mind receiving your praise, Lord, on that day, Lord. Okay? I think that's fine. Okay? It's not a bad attitude. The Lord is pleased when we want to serve him fruitfully and obey him and please him. Because we know he's going to reward us. That's how God made us. We respond to reward, don't we? And don't we want to avoid punishment? and respond to positive reinforcement. Who made us that way? God made us that way. 
You get it? So it's not being unspiritual. That's how we are made. We respond to reward and punishment. Why do you believe in Jesus? Because you don't want to go to hell. <laughs> All right? Does that make sense? All right. So we should want to avoid suffering any loss in our eternal reward. Amen? You don't want to stand before the Lord and say, you know, my, my son, my daughter, you, you did really well. But, you know, there was that time in your life when uh, things weren't going so well. I, I was disappointed in you. Okay? And that could mean possible loss in the eternal reward. Okay? Therefore, we should make it our goal to please him while in the body here on earth by doing what is good. Amen. Now, let's find out what good means. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. So it is very scriptural to fear the Lord. All right. We love the Lord, but we must also fear him, revere him. Okay. It is not enough simply to love God. We must also fear him. All right. Let's look at how our reward is determined. Okay. According to scripture, it turns out that quality counts the quality of your work here on earth for the lord factors into the determination of your eternal reward and this is based on first corinthians 3 verse 9 for we are co-workers in god's service you are god's field god's building by the grace has give god has given me i laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it Okay, this is the Apostle Paul. But each one should build with care. Now, okay, each one of us, we're serving the Lord, right? We're building something for the Lord. Each one of us. Whenever you preach the gospel, whenever you're teaching, whatever you're doing, you're building for the Lord. And he says, build with care. With care. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, you see, in your service to the Lord, whatever you do, you have a choice of materials that you use in your ministry. You can use precious stones like gold, silver, costly stones, very expensive, you have to sacrifice. Or you can use cheap materials like wood, hay, or straw. Okay? It's up to you what kind of materials you want to use to serve the Lord. Okay? Your work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. Now, here on earth, we don't know what kind of materials you're using whether gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw. Sometimes we don't know, okay? But on that day, our work is going to be tested with fire. And guess what? The wood, hay, and straw, those materials are going to be burned up. Your works will be burned up. It will not stand the test of fire, okay? If what he has built survives, if you have used gold, silver, precious stones in your ministry to the Lord, it will survive. You will receive your reward. If it is burned up, we will suffer loss. We ourselves will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Okay. You will be saved. Okay. Your salvation is intact. I'm reminded of this illustration, you know, a house is on fire, okay? And there are people living inside the house and they're trying to get out, okay? They just want to save themselves, so they leave behind everything, okay? And as they're coming out of the house, the clothes get burned off of their, their bodies and, and they, they reach safety outside, but they're completely naked, okay? They made it, but everything has been burned up. And this will happen to some believers on that day, okay? Your works will be burned up. You yourself will be saved, but no eternal reward because you have used wood, hay, and straw in your ministry to the Lord, okay? So we must use costly materials for God, amen? 
If you don't, your works may be burned up and you might suffer loss in the eternal reward. Okay. What does it mean to, co to use costly materials? Well, it, it depends. It means different things for different people. All right. But personally for me, I strive to be very diligent and careful with scripture because teachers will be more strictly judged. Okay. I'm a teacher. I will be more strictly judged. I do not want to lead God's people astray. So I, I strive to be very diligent and very careful with scripture. Stay close to scripture. Don't stretch it. Don't sweeten it to make people feel good. All right. I work hard and conscientiously. I will sacrifice and store my treasure in heaven. Okay, I sacrifice. I'm not after the gold, not in this life. We have enough. I'm not after the gold. I'm not after the glory. I will sacrifice, store my treasure in heaven, and there it will be waiting for me at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, that's what it means to me personally, all right? So I'm not interested in becoming famous, becoming a superstar. I just want to do what God has given me to do, which is to train God's people to fulfill the Great Commission. Okay. Now, it turns out that quantity also counts. Quantity, not only quality, but quantity also counts. Let's look at the parable of the talents. In this talent, we see 10 servants, and each one of them has equal ability. All right, let's look at this parable. Luke 19, verse 12. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Okay, now who is this nobleman? Who does he represent? Uh, who? Jesus, yes, okay. This nobleman represents Jesus. Right now, he has gone to a distant country. He has gone up to heaven and he is appointed king, and someday he will return, all right? So this parable is talking about none other than Jesus, okay? So before he left, he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minus. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back, all right? And so he called 10 servants, and he gave each the same amount of funds, one mina. Okay, which means all 10 of them had the same ability. Each one received a single mina. Okay, and he said, put this money to work until I come back. And then the master went away. Okay, after a long time, the master returned. And then he called the servants to account for what they had done with what he had entrusted to them. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. Is that pretty good? How many percent return is that? 1,000% return, 1,000%, if my math has not escaped me, okay? Look what the master said, well done, my good servant, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Wow, all he did was turn a few dollars into a few hundred dollars, and. Now he's going to rule over 10 cities on behalf of his master. Okay, that's the grace of God. You know, you do a little bit, God sees you are faithful. Look at the reward, authority over 10 cities. So the master rewarded the servant according to the quantity of his production. He earned a profit of 10 minus for his, servant, for his master. The master gave him authority over 10 cities. Do you see that? The reward was exactly proportional to his fruit, his production. The second servant came and said, hey, your mina has earned five more. I got five more mina for you, 500% return. His master answered, okay, you take charge of five cities. Do you see the pattern there? The master rewarded the second servant according to the quantity of his production as well, right? You see, God is fair. He also takes into account quantity, not only quality, but also quantity. Shouldn't he? Okay, he's talking about reward based on our works. So both quality and quantity are important. 
Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you didn't put in and reap what you did not sow. Jesus, uh, I don't want to use this power and authority to heal the sick. I mean, what if, what if nothing happens and people are not healed and I disappoint you, Jesus? So, oh, Jesus, uh, I'm not going to use this power and authority. I'm just going to leave it in church and I'm just going to let the, the others use it. Uh, Lord, uh, no, not me, Lord. Uh, okay. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. Uh, and he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. This third servant received no reward at all. And it was given to the one who had 10. In the economy of the kingdom of God, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. <laughs> okay, you see that? <laughs> those who are faithful get more and more. Those who are not faithful, less and less and less. Okay, so... He even lost what he had. Second Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we also, we will also reign with him. Okay. That is part of our eternal reward, reigning with Christ in the next age. Our eternal reward will consist in part of authority to reign with Jesus Christ in his kingdom in the next age authority to reign with Christ. So why not learn authority right here first? <laughs> Let's learn authority right here first so that when we enter into the next age, we will understand how to rule on behalf of Jesus Christ. And we're also going to have authority to judge. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2, or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? So let us therefore obey the Lord's holy commands, especially the great commission with all of our hearts. Our eternal reward will in part be based on what we have produced for him during our time on earth. Okay? So you have been given a talent. You've been given a, a mina. All right? Let's call it a talent. It's called authority and power over disease and demons to be used and confirming to the lost that our God is the only true God. Okay, you have that talent now. Unfortunately, you are more accountable than you were before you stepped into this room. <laughs> I hope you don't regret coming to this training, but you are now far more accountable than you were before. Okay, if you use it, praise God you will hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. But if you don't use it, it will be taken away from you and given to someone else. You, you don't want to end up like that third servant, do you? No, no, <laughs> all right? So you've been given this talent. Now you're going to go and use it, right? That's the whole point of this. You sit here, you get this teaching, that's great. But the whole point is for you to use it for the sake of the Great Commission. Amen? So after this training is over, don't just put it on the shelf and let it collect dust, which is sometimes what happens, right? Don't put it on the shelf. Apply it. Apply it. Because this is what you can use to maximize your eternal reward for Jesus Christ. Because it's called the Great Commission. Why do you think they call it the Great Commission? It's important. It's very important to the Lord. It has to be fulfilled before he returns. And you have a part in the Great Commission. And now you understand the use of this power and authority in order to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay. So this is, this is why you should obey God. This is why you want to preach the gospel and make disciples. Yes, brother. Creative miracles. So oh. Someone doesn't have a leg or an organ mm. or a, a, like a pacemaker or a splint or, mm -hmm. or metal in their back. Yeah. Or, okay. I mean, is that, is that a, under the authority of a believer? Okay. I believe so. Okay. I have not yet seen 
or create a miracle where a missing leg, a missing limb was recreated. But nothing is impossible for God. So you go for it. Even though I haven't seen it, but you go for it, okay? Uh, the, the pacemakers. <sighs> you mean like a pacemaker disappearing or something? Is that what you mean? Yeah, crazy stuff. <laughs> Nothing is impossible for God, okay? Go for it. If it doesn't happen, but go for it, okay? All right? Go for it. <laughs> Why not? Nothing is impossible for God, and nothing is impossible for those who have faith of God, and that's you. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord, for the precious opportunity of fellowshipping with your servants here, Lord, your servants who have come so eager, Lord, to obey you, so thirsty, Lord, to know you better, to know your word, and to bear fruit for you. What a privilege, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord, that you have given us to share. Father, again, Lord, let this word be a very fruitful seed planted in the hearts of your people, Lord, a seed that will be very fruitful, 30, 60, 100, a thousand times what was sown, Lord. Put in their hearts, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, a great boldness, Lord, and a, uh, a great burden, Lord, to reach the nations during these last days, Father. Thank you, Lord. Open doors for them. Give them strategy. Give them understanding of how they, they are to use this weapon for the sake of the gospel during these last days. Use them to do the impossible, things that I have never seen or heard, Lord. Use them to do these miracles, dear Father. Thank you, Lord, especially, Lord, for these young people who have come, Lord, and who are fully committed to you and want to serve you with all of their hearts for the rest of their lives, Lord, which is still quite a few years left, Lord. Use them, Lord, these young people fruitfully, O oh God, so that when they stand before you, Lord, they will not be ashamed, but they will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful blessing. And now, Lord, thank you for the food that we are about to receive. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen, amen.